Hi everyone, I'm here with my friend Scott Beatty, who is a local sound mixer and audio professional here in the Atlanta community, who has a pretty diversified resume and is the reason why I chose him and he graciously agreed to take on the project of wiring my newly updated sound cart, which has the Aton Cantar X3 and Cantar Rest. So, uh, how's it going? It's going great. Um, yeah, the cart got a huge upgrade and doing the wiring was a fantastic little project. So uh, we learned a lot and I think we got a great result. So I picked up the X3 late September-ish last year and just with busy schedules and finishing up shows, um, we did our first measurement, when was it, January? Mm -hmm. So we got, you know, after the holidays and so forth, got together and Scott did some measurements. And I had roughly placed the gear where I wanted it on the cart and thought about ergonomics and the input output requirements, all the different equipment that was going to be in there. And he came over and Scott, so what to do some measurements? So, so what's the first step for you typically when figuring out? how you're going to take on a large custom wiring job such as a production sound cart like this. Sure. Uh, the first part was was super, you know, straightforward but super important, you know, just listing the inputs and outputs for all the different things that we wanted, the way that we wanted devices to plug into each other and the way that we wanted things to sit physically uh, because placement is everything as far as the length in a custom job. And once we got that, you know, planning it up like a loom. Uh, we did it just like you would do a, um, a loom for a car where you've got many different cables running to all the different systems into one central line and then fanning out where things need to fan out and plug into devices so that on the inside of your cart, all your cabling is bundled together. It's running on the outside of the cart and, and all of your runs to the devices are the lengths they need to be just to get to the devices and have enough access room and the lengths that you're going to need to plug and unplug, that those have enough length that you can plug them and unplug them to any device you might need to, uh, but they're not so long that you're dealing with stuff like cables hanging out of the cart, extra slack that you've got to wrap up somehow in the cart. Uh, so the lengths were really uh, critical. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we discussed in this project was field serviceability. So you had asked me some pretty key questions such as, is the shelf for uh, the X3 going to be a, a sliding shelf or was mm -hmm. it going to be fixed? And at first we were going to go with sliding. Yes. I remember. And then, and I threw you some curveballs. There were some curveballs. Yeah. Like things, things changed as far as, you know, this is going here. This is not coming out anymore. And when we had yeah. planned the looms, um, the entire plan for the looms was we gave you know we a foot of extra length. So so about and a we foot. We ended up using all of it because 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 <laughs> my my initial thought with building it was that I wanted it was really important that it feels serviceable. I couldn't get it out of my head that I wanted to be able to at least pull the piece of equipment out enough to disconnect or reconnect another piece of equipment because if it was too tight. In, in my mind especially, it was gonna to be too difficult to pull that yes. off, or if it was blocked by another piece of gear. And uh, so I looked in, I called you because I found these five inch recessed uh, rack mounts for the yep. monitors, which to me was the hugest thing because it was gonna free up all the space on the front of the Cantar. Because the whole idea was I wanted to make sure that I could access the the faders and trim knobs, yes. or you know, they're assignable to any function. But all, all, all of those Cantar controls that are all the Cantar controls access. on top of the yep. unit on the cart. Um, so that solved that problem. So then we went down this next path of, well, let's make it tighter. Let's not put the extra slack where it's not needed. And it and it ended up just making it was the right decision because. Yes. Really, when we once we started installing and putting the cables in on the gear, it became very, very apparent that getting my hands in there to disconnect and yes. connect things, we, having we that extra cable was not going to work. Your hands into not enough space. Yeah. It's not it's to mention hard. the extra weight that <laughs> yes. you're going to you add on. So, um, 
So tell me about uh, the type of cables that you chose to go with for the snakes and, and, and in general. Uh, did you do something different for audio versus AES? Um, how did you handle labeling? Like kind of what was, cause, cause I gave you kind of freedom on that because yes. with your background, I knew you were going to know specifically what was going to be best. Just get the best stuff. Yep. And that's what we want to go with. That's what we went with. Um, so what we ended up doing is we had your venue receivers. We had two six channel receivers. So for those, we used eight channel snake cables, cut off two of the channels. Okay. And, uh, and ended up with six channel snake looms for each of those. And what kind of cable was? This was with Mogami, uh, mm -hmm. eight channel, two core um, shielded cable. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we were able to get that cable, find the length that it needs to be and fan it out and, and even getting the fan outs to the right length so that they fall into the venue systems, um, you know, just getting the right lengths on all of the fans now you wow. now you were able to download on the Atom website like a two scale size schematic of the X3 because yes. I didn't send you home with it. No, that's and, and, yeah. And and so when you were building that, I noticed you had posted online photos. So you were able to build those snakes and those fan outs yes. without actually having the gear with you. Yeah, that was important. The way that we the way that this build had to go because of the amount of labor that it was going to take wiring it, I really wanted to do it at my shop where I had all my tools, all my, uh, you know, shrink tubing, all the different, um, you know, hand tools that I might use. So we needed a way to mock up the cables into the cart, uh, find out where the runs are going to go, where the ends are going to land, find the exact lengths and tie those all together in one loom that twists together and, and sits together and then bring that whole monster out of the cart get it to the shop, put the connectors on it, bring it back here, put the final cable back into the cart and, you know, and all of that has to work with exact lengths. We can't get it back in the cart and find something's two inches too short. And, and what's interesting too is, is with the lengths that you built, I definitely threw like some uh, wild cards your way. Like, yes. oh wait, I'm gonna, cause you know, I have a 552 in the front end for an additional five analog inputs using the two, the AS3, AS42 ports on the X3, because I wanted to use them for additional analog, music playback, time cut aux, and crew comm systems, and without yep. using any of my other analog inputs. Um, so, you know, in moving around, we, we partially was kind of some good luck, you know, yes. with, with, you know, because the 552 initially, for some reason, I had on the rear of the cart, mm -hmm. and then we moved it to the front of the cart, even after we were pretty much done with the install. Yes. And that's, that can be a challenge. In a 16 space rack, it seems like a lot of space, but you can run out really quick. And you can run out in the wrong, yeah. wrong ways. Yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. we found that out with the 552, just where it was sitting originally. Yeah. Uh, it worked for how we wanted the equipment to be, but yeah. even when we got into thinking like accessibility into the rack like being able to dig around to the back of the devices uh it was just in the wrong spot so it, yeah because it was yeah. when it was on the rear of the cart it was blocking access to the venues yep and then and then i thought about well how do i get it on the front of the cart and it just so happened that i was able to move something around and drill because we did have to drill some extra holes into some of the rack shelving that wasn't already there to make some of this work because it's like well i want it to fit here but the racks aren't going to line up so you got to modify i'm just going to modify these so things. yeah you, there's no off the yeah. shelf uh sound cart yeah available and, that's that's already done up you gotta you gotta see what you have but sometimes you gotta punch holes and things i, I gotta talk about uh for fun our our fratter day together yes and you know so there were there were several trips involved when scott first did all the measurements like we spoke about, and then there was the layout, and we had to really firm up on what I was gonna use specifically gear-wise, because there was some ideas as far as, well, different types of patch bays or workflows that we might use. And the patch bays were gonna change everything. If yeah, <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we had talked about doing D-Sub, actually integrating D-Sub patch bays rather than the XLR ones that we ended up going with, and it turned out, I laid it all out on a uh, like a schematic I did with white paper tape, the signal flow of it, and I realized that it just wasn't gonna offer enough benefit. Once we laid everything out, he came and measured, 
and then you had soldered the, the cables without the connectors, just the loom and everything, and mm -hmm. brought that over. And then there was the add, the connectors part, and we were just going. We were like, okay, and moving. And I think we worked together um, for, what was it, like a 14-hour? It how was long, how it, long was it? It was a good long day. I th yeah, I, you didn't leave here till like five or came in before noon, and yeah, yeah it was uh, it was we, intense. We burned the the midnight oil <laughs> on that one, but I mean, it's it, it's all the details, the yeah. dressing, yeah, the the labeling, um, yeah. You know, talk talk about the labeling, uh, the labeling a little bit. Okay, like so for these cables, uh, we went the, with the Neutrik XX line of XLR connectors. Uh, for everything and which are color coded, obviously, right? Yeah. They they can be. Um, the great thing that I like about that line of cables is, or that line of connectors, is you've got different coloring options for the boots. Um, I've even got uh, some some white casings and some black casings for the shell, mm -hmm. uh, and so we use the white casings on line level connectors um, on the uh, Cantar itself. There's several connectors side by side, and Two of them are line, and six of them are are, an, are are mic level. And let's let's talk about also the what kind of cable is typically did you use to install in this cart? Like what brand, model, all that. So for this uh, install, we went with Megami eight channel analog snake cable. So mm -hmm. it's uh, eight um, individual balance cables, uh, and it's just got one overall jacketing on it. Uh, mm -hmm. The same thing. They make an AES cable that's 110 ohms that's a little bit thicker. That's Megami as well. Megami yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we use some Megami uh, single XLRs for your 552, the two AS42 outputs. We ran those on single 110 ohm cables. Okay. And um, and what about the, the snakes for the, uh, the analog in for the X3? The X3 was, it was using the um, Megami eight channel snake mm -hmm. cable and mm -hmm. we just simply cut off uh, the channel seven and eight on mm -hmm. both of those, so we ended up with two six-channel okay. snakes for those, and those line up with the two six-channel outputs from the yeah. venue, and then the twelve. Uh, I love twelve that analog I, inputs for the. I, I love you know, and I left it up to you. I didn't say, hey, I wanted this kind of cable and stuff like this because I kind of relied on your expertise, because Megami obviously would have been a great request uh, in over Canary, not like one is you know I just am familiar with that yep. and so forth. I know Canary is a great cable, but also a more affordable cable. Yep. Um, but I wouldn't have caught the 110 ohm thing for the AES, so that's great. Um, and what's, what's important about using a quality cable? What makes a quality cable versus a budget cable? Like if, if I had to wire something with Canari or Megami, I'm not worrying about a thing. Okay. Um, they're both great to work with. I love working with Megami with the, um, with the shield that wraps around. It's very mm -hmm. easy to fan out rather than the braided shield that you kind of mm -hmm. have to if you've if you've wired with a braided shield cable, it does take a little bit more work to get it apart. Uh, it's very pliable. The Megami cables in general are are super pliable and easy to handle. That's great when you're you know running things up and through. Mm -hmm. And um, the Canari eight channel snake cable, it's just a little thicker and it's a little less uh, less pliable. I feel than the mm -hmm. Megami from the sample that I that I ordered. So mm -hmm. yeah, and, and and one of the things that we did and and. I'm glad we did was, I mean, all of the power, all of the audio and all of the RF uh, is all completely on three separate runs. I mean, yes. there's three categories yes. basically inside of the car and they don't populate together. And I finished the, you know, uh, five analog inputs on the 552, which I was very proud of myself because I am not you did a great. wiring guy. Yeah, Scott, he inspected. Well, he didn't expect yeah, He probably will. I have haven't taken them out. <laughs> and I'm a big proponent of the craft. Like, I, I don't take, you know, sound mixing lightly. I don't take cabling uh, lightly. Did I say nicely? See, I don't take, uh, you know, like I think at this level of the game and the type of stuff that we're doing and narrative workflows and, and other type shows, it's like I really like to work with professionals on that's what they do. You know, uh, I don't, maybe I probably may have not been able to struggle my way through a build like this, but I would have never attempted it. Yeah. And, I, and I think if, if I did, it would have been more about me showing that I could do it mm -hmm. less than really getting a good job done. And, yep. and, and I find that most mixers, 
you know, it's, I can't speak for everyone, but would prefer to have a professional wiring person wire the car. And I think what makes you unique, Scott, is that you also work as a sound mixer. You've got extensive reality experience um, for like higher end shows that have really complex workflows. And you've also got narrative experience working uh, as a sound utility and music playback. Yep. Correct. Correct. Because uh, you are a union guy, just like me. I'm both a union dude. Four, seven, nine yep. members. And, um, and then you have this cabling skill. And, 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 I, and I just, I'm impressed with that. I think that's a pretty well-rounded skill set. And, and it's interesting to me how sound mixers, boom operators, sound utility, you know, the whole craft, whether you're in post or whatever, like all have like similar backgrounds, but a little different. Like yes, each person, yeah, there's a, a huge like I, I dabbed work. in post, like when I, you know, and that's kind of like my thing. Like yeah. I, I lived in that world for a while, so I have a lot of knowledge about that. Uh, but work as a production sound mixer, you know, yeah. I mean, would you say it's kind of the same thing with you with cabling and then your focus is sound mixing it's, or? I mean, that's that's the amazing thing that I've gotten from being in the Atlanta sound community because mm -hmm. our community is so diverse. We do have some, you know, people who are career mixers in one specific field. But you've got people yeah, that true. do corporate, you've got people that do yeah. sports, you've got people that do broadcast, AV, uh, you know, cabling, music, uh, you know, stage work, you know, plays. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many different areas of knowledge that, that people do have broad skill sets. But, but yeah, the, the cabling skill set... Even if you don't do stuff where you're going to wire a rack of stuff and you're going to have 30 inputs and 30 outputs, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like most sound mixers would be benefited. Uh, mixers, utilities. Um, if you're working in a professional sound department for film, you really should uh, make sure that your cabling at least is is on point that you could fix something in a in a pinch or mm -hmm. you know worst case you have to you know something goes down on set something gets pulled on set you could mend it the night and yeah, bring it back I mean, the next day. I think you're right as that there's a difference between a field repair and, and a full custom job. Yes. And both are critical. It's, it's important it, to have a great install. So you're not doing field repairs, hopefully as often as you need to on cables. Obviously yes. sometimes cables get run over or they get damaged, especially cables that are laying out on set, like the long XLR runs that we occasionally might use that would need to be quad core, right? Or yep. the... 50 ohm for the antennas that are being remoted to set. And, 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 That's and, important. And, and what are the the key cables, in, in your opinion, that a, a sound utility should know how to repair and or make? Like if there was a short yep. list, I have my list, I'd like to hear your list. I've, I've, got, I've got three or four. Um, you know, the Hiroshi power cables that are four pin power cables that work for our mixers and things. Those things are, are the small ones. Yeah, the small oh ones. Oh my god! Yeah, you, I've already failed. You sh you should know how to yeah how to do one of those. Yeah. Um, or at least it would be a huge plus. Those yeah. things are really expensive to get. BDS power cables. Those are super simple. Yeah. XLRs, simplest thing in the world. And TA connectors like we have on the end of our lavalier microphones. Oh, those yeah. things That's go out one. all the time. That's you should be able one. to. You should know what you're doing for fixing one of those yeah. and know the resistor values if you're looking mm -hmm. at making a line input or a mic input cable for your wireless. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, my list, uh, definitely XLR, TA3, which yep. is mini XLR, uh, BNC. Got to add that to the list. Those yes, nonstop what, abuse. Those get Anything. slammed in doors yeah. and pulled 50 at the ohm, ends. 75 ohm. You know, so I got a crimp set, spare connectors on those. TA3 and XLR, and you know I'm not the best soldering or cabling person in the world, but I I can show usually any utility how to do those basic cables. Yes, which I think it's important the mixer knows it too. You it's, know, you, you go like, hey, you should know this, but you don't know how to do it. That's kind of weird. There, there's a few specifics <laughs> yeah, yeah, about yeah, yeah. how to do it, but Just it's saying, not rocket science. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I and I think most uh, pro level mixers working uh, have those fundamental skills, you know, and and usually expect obviously the sound utilities coming in to also learn those skills. It's, I, that's how it's I see it. It's a huge plus. Like if someone is like, oh, I don't know how to do this, and, but I want to learn, and I really, can you show me? That's what's important to me, is like being able to show 
and say, okay, here's how you do it specifically, because I think a lot of times this is someone never really showed them. You know, it's hard because it's not everything is available on YouTube, and 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 it takes practice. Mm -hmm. So like, here's a a bunch of busted cables. See if you can fix these that don't really need to be repaired. Yep. So that way, when something does happen in the moment, it's like. Yeah, it's not panic. It's like, hey, I think I can fix that at least to get through the day. Yep. I think, you know, whether it's just adding a little bit of solder Mm -hmm. on the end of, you know, an XLR cable that's connected to a boom like those coiled cables. Um, So, yeah, cable, I mean, cabling is such a huge, there's just, there's, there's custom, there's what you do and what you did on this cart, which is absolutely beautiful work. And, and then there's field repairs and then there's just basic cable building. Scott, thanks for coming by. And Pleasure talking to us about uh, your philosophy and about the experience on building out a cart like this. Um, it was important for me to do this because I really wanted to showcase your work and really show the community out there what an amazing job you did on this cart, uh, especially for other professionals who may want to do custom cart work. You can find Scott's, uh, he's on Facebook. Uh, right? You I'm, on, I'm on the Facebook. He's out there, so I don't even need to put his info below because you'll be able to find it. Um, I learned a lot through the process by going through this process with you, and it's got me really excited about working with this new card on future projects. And um, thanks also to Gary uh, True Audio Atlanta, who also assisted with some of the power, uh, the powering cables and portions of this cart. And thanks for watching, and hopefully we'll see you guys soon.